The disaster that was that Dynamite show closing two weeks ago, and just in general, a pretty bad show. This company really needed to come out of the gate strong to start the new year, wash that taste out of everybody's mouth, and chart a new path forward. And the venue for the show looked really, really good on TV. I'm sure it was good in person as well. I thought Taz on commentary brought some real value here. Would like to see him, believe it or not, actually be a part of commentary more. And, and while I can say perhaps there were some things that were better about this week's show, there's still a lot of issues here and a lot of problems. And you can't just excuse every single thing away due to being a sheep fan or the company being new. You're on primetime TV now. You're in the major leagues. It's time to start acting like it. The show kicks off with the Darby Allen versus Cody Rhodes match. And to me, this is perfectly fine. This is a match that has story, has reason for happening, that we know was coming. This goes back to their time limit draw on the pay-per-view months ago. They've worked tag matches together. Like, that is perfectly fine. This is the type of match that you should be featuring in a prime spot on your weekly show. And looking at Darby Allen, at least they didn't dive directly into the match. At least they showed the video package. They tried to do something with him. I don't know if he's necessarily my jam, but I could see how he could resonate for that audience. That ring gear, though, I'm sorry. Something's got to give. Something's got to change there. That said, what irritated me about this was the actual premise of the match. Cody Rhodes is supposed to be one of your top guys because he is one of your top guys. And I think this speaks to kind of being in a bubble of arrogance, of thinking that you're bigger and better than you actually are. It's bad enough that Cody Rhodes, months ago on a pay-per-view that maybe 100,000 people watched, worked a time limit draw with a no-name like Darby Allen. But now you're on TV. Now you're in prime time. And for a company that needs to focus and build on their weekly television product, you need stars. And you desperately need stars if you're AEW. And while I question just how much star power Cody Rhodes truly has, the fact of the matter remains is he's one of their biggest names. As a result, what he should not be doing is wrestling 50-50 super competitive matches with a Darby Allen. It speaks to the, well, I'm going to help make this guy because I'm so over. No, the hell you're not. Stop it. It doesn't help Cody Rhodes. It doesn't help AEW. It doesn't even help Darby Allen. All it does is devalue Cody, which devalues Darby, and it doesn't work. And beyond all of that, I thought whole, part of the whole premise of Cody doing this thing with all elite wrestling was that he wanted to show that he could go out and do it on his own. So he's bringing in Arn Anderson. Now, where the hell did this come from? And why does this make any sense, especially considering the rivalry that Arn and his daddy used to have back in the past? And then beyond all of that, a guy like Darby Allen, who is a nothing in the grand scheme of things right now, especially from a kayfabe perspective, Cody Rhodes is not only working a competitive 50-50 match with him, but he has to get tips and hints from a guy like Arn Anderson in order to beat said Darby Allen. Sure, a lot of people are going to love this match because they love Cody or they love Darby Allen. Or they love the fact that they get to live a little bit of nostalgia with Arn Anderson. But this is stupid. You need to be in the process of making stars over the next few months. This does not make stars. It just makes everybody involved look dumb. Marcus Smart here. And I gotta tell you, that good-for-nothing swag daddy always has to find something to complain about with the wrestling companies that I love and adore. Darby Allen is awesome. He is a breakout star, one of the wrestlers to watch in 2020. You can count on it. You leave his ring gear alone. It is unique. It is different. And he is awesome. And as far as, oh, why is Arn Anderson there? Well, look it up on the internet, Schleg Daddy. That's what a true fan of wrestling would do, okay? Anybody can sit there and explain the reasons on TV. Real fans know that you gotta do your own research. And as far as the working the 50-50 match, that is invalid criticism from an invalid YouTube person in the Schleg Daddy. What the hell would he know? All I know is this, is Darby Allen is awesome. Of course Cody struggled with him because Darby Allen is one of the best wrestlers in the world.
Next match is this women's four-way title match. And, and I've got a few questions here. Number one, why is Riho, who hasn't been on TV for weeks, if I remember correctly, being punished here by being thrown into this four-way match and then having to defend her title next week? How does that make any sense? What did these other women do to deserve a title shot like this? This is just dumb stuff here. Not to mention the even dumber thing, which is why do they persist with Riho as their women's champion? She's lame as hell. There's a reason you haven't even been bothering to feature her on television. You're telling yourself the story, but yet they persist. All the while, in this match, the one person that really stands out above the rest, like her or not, is Nyla Rose. And yet you sit there and you're having her sell this stuff to, by comparison, lady midgets. And that shouldn't be happening. Have the monster work like a monster. It's all this stupid crap of everybody's got to get the crap in. Everybody wants to shine where nobody actually gets over. And it would have been so much better, frankly, if Nyla Rose would have been their first women's champion. Because at least, if nothing else, you could sit there and say, the liberals would have loved it and the conservatives would have hated it. At least everybody would have potentially cared. And even beyond that, why is Nyla even in this match? Wasn't she suspended for attacking an official? So now you bring her back and she's rewarded. Like, this is the type of nonsensical crap that we see from another wrestling company that we're expecting somebody that wants to be counterculture to them not to freaking do. And then after the match, where Rio still finds a way to freaking win, like they just can't quit her, then you have Nyla attack her and put her through a table. Why? Why are we supposed to care about the women in this match? Why are we supposed to care about Rio as a champion? Why is Nyla Rose not the women's champion? And why do you have Rio still win and then Nyla attack her afterwards? Why, why, why? Even though you have fans that are familiar with the talent, if you are actually trying to grow your audience, you need to, especially in your formative stages, develop who your characters are. Give them backstory. Give us reasons to care about them. Who are the best friends? Yes, I've seen them hug and da-da-da-da-da. But why are they best friends? What makes them best friends? Let's tell more of that story. Who is Orange Cassidy? The crowd pops for him, so apparently the crowd likes him. But as a television viewer, I have no real reason to know why this guy gets such a big reaction. Tell me a little bit more about his backstory and so forth. But nonetheless, you've got Trent taking on John Moxley. Why is Trent wrestling Moxley? The more important question, again, when it comes to this 50-50 garbage, is why is Trent wrestling a match when he is a nobody right now? He's part of a tag team. They're not tag champions. They're not number one contenders. They're not any of that crap. Why is he wrestling a 50-50 competitive match pushing Moxley, who is your number one contender for all intents and purposes, for the world champion? You're preparing Moxley to wrestle Chris Jericho. Why is he struggling to beat Trent? This isn't productive. It doesn't get Trent more over. It doesn't get Moxley more over. It's just dumb. Moxley, again, just like Cody, is one of those guys that right now is one of your more recognizable names that you have on your roster. One of the guys that you can put the least amount of effort into to get potentially the maximum amount of reward in terms of bang for your buck. As a result, you have to build your product around guys like that. And trying to sit there and have him wrestle 50-50 matches with a freaking Trent Beretta ain't going to get the job done, son. After that, though, you transition right into Sammy Guevara coming out. And it's Chris Jericho on the big screen offering 49% stake to Moxley if he joins the inner circle, offering him a 4GT. Like, that stuff was really good, leading right into Dustin Rhodes and Sammy Guevara. You've got Elite versus inner circle. And I really like the smooth kind of transition here, how one thing can build towards one thing but also tie into and lead to another. That is good. Dustin Rose, in his 50s, can still go. That is good. You know, you're not a retirement home for wrestlers. Got a couple of guys with names. Chris Jericho is clearly the established legend. Dustin Rhodes is a legend in his own right, but on a lower scale. So it makes sense for him to be wrestling guys like Sammy Guevara. Like, a lot of things about this works. What doesn't work, though, to me, is when you have Dustin Rhodes hitting Sammy Guevara with a freaking Canadian Destroyer on the ring apron. Not only are we overusing the Canadian Destroyer spot, 
We are overusing it in matches where the story doesn't justify it in any way, shape, or form, and especially because all throughout the show, you're going to see several of the move at the same damn time. That a Canadian destroyer should be something that is a finish or a damn near finish. And instead, just like the DDT and so many other moves, it's just become another damn move. And I'm kind of disappointed that Dustin would do something like this. You're better than this. Don't subscribe to this match mark, move mark garbage. Teach these guys how to actually wrestle and how to actually work. I gotta tell you, Sammy Guevara truly is a Spanish god shooting his shots. And the ladies would be fools to turn him down. And if anybody knows anything about the ladies, promise you, it's me, Marcus Smart. Chris Jericho is an absolute legend, a promo god. And as far as Dustin Rhodes goes, and the Canadian destroyer Welsh like daddy, times have changed. Not everybody wants to sit there and watch five-minute bear hugs and ten-minute feats of strength. We want to see fast-paced ass-kicking action. And that's exactly what Dustin Rhodes did. And as far as the Canadian destroyer on the ring apron, Canadian destroyers make me come after a couple of weeks of not booking him on the show for reasons that are unbeknownst to anybody with a brain, we've got Maxwell Jacob Freeman with a live hot mic. And you can just watch the work happen. How refreshing is it in today's wrestling world where everybody wants to be cool and everybody wants to be liked because they're so damn insecure. You got a guy that actually is okay and comfortable with being hated. He embraces the hate and I absolutely love it. This is how it's supposed to be done. I was sure, granted, I wish they would have went with a slower burn on the story between him and Cody, and they wish they wouldn't have already done the turn at the Full Gear pay-per-view. Thought you could have gotten more mileage out of it, but nonetheless, they went there, and we can make the most out of it. But damn. Like, this is how it's supposed to be. The heel says, I'll face Cody, but he's got to do this, this, and this. He can't touch me until the pay-per-view. The match has to be at the pay-per-view. He's got to face Wardlow in AEW's first ever steel cage match, and then I get to whip him like a government mule ten times. Those are the terms and conditions. Like, this is how it's supposed to be. Think about it, people. You're not talking about the moves that a Cody does or the moves that an MJF does. You're talking about the heat between these two. It's not the damn moves that matter. It's the characters and the stories that get you emotionally invested that make the moves and the matches matter. Brings us to this week's Maxwell Jacob Fact. Every week, you're getting one of these. Why? Because the man deserves it. This takes us back in time to when he was in his formative years as a young man. He made an appearance on the Rosie O'Donnell Show where he talked about his goals in life to become a singer and become a professional wrestler. So let me get this straight. From a very, very young age, he was able to go out on a national talk show, which was highly watched at the time, in Rosie O'Donnell, and be a command presence. It was like it was foretelling of the future. Basically, since this man dropped out of his mama's womb, he had star written all over him. And if he wanted to be a singer, he most certainly could. But most importantly of all, because of his natural talent, because he was born to be a star, he was able to call his shot and say he was going to be a wrestler. And not only is he a wrestler, he's one of the best damn wrestlers in the world already. And he's still got a long way to go in his career. Accompany my foot. You're in the major leagues now. Act like it. Fix the audio issues. That's ridiculous. You can't hear what people are saying backstage because you don't know how to make that transition. We're supposed to be listening to this person and what they're saying, and instead we're hearing the generic theme music that you're running through the damn arena. We couldn't hear what Rio and her translator was saying. Frankly, that was to our benefit. Really couldn't make out much of what Britt Baker was saying. Again, that certainly was to our benefit. But the more important thing was you had the music running when the Luchasaurus was trying to talk. Fix this! It's Bush League! No excuses! New company, my foot! You want to be taken seriously? 
Then act like you deserve to be taken seriously and make sure when the Luchasaurus is going to open his mouth that I am able to hear it. And for those of you that are going to crap on the fact that Luchasaurus is actually talking and that's a bad thing, you know what, jerks? It's called evolution! I will say this. I'm a big fan if they continue to pursue the cowboy shit stuff, but... <laughs> <laughs> the random things they do every week when they show Hangman Adam Page's graphic, and this week has been drinking. I love it. You know, not everything has to be serious here. We're still ultimately talking about professional wrestling and mostly half-naked men in underpants wrestling each other. Let's get a grip on reality sometimes here. And especially the little full house type of moment that he had where he just kind of turned as he was sipping on a drink and he kind of went, oh. Like, that shit popped me legitimately. That was awesome. As far as this six-man main event tag match that he was out there for, Pac and the Lucha Brothers taking on Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, I'll say this. This type of match is never really going to be my cup of tea. Nor does it necessarily have to be, but, but it's never going to be. I think these are the types of matches that are an epidemic throughout professional wrestling today. Everybody's trying to get moves in. Everybody's trying to get themselves over. Nobody's really truly getting over. You're not really telling a story at all. You know, kind of the lazy way to do wrestling. But these guys do it, and it's a problem throughout the industry. Who's the who's the legal man? You know, where's the hot tech? You know, all these basic fundamental things that they just don't do anymore. That said, at least I can say the match worked for the live audience. They loved it. The right team went over in the right way. This was the type of finish that you should be having to the show. It doesn't mean that I have to be a raging fan of it, but I can at least say, look, if you think the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega are guys that you want to build around, then you need to do much better than what you've done with them the past three months. This is an example of where they need to not worry so much about the criticism of booking themselves to go over because the bottom line is, is they need to go over more if this company is going to work because they put a lot of eggs into their basket. What they did the first three months of this company, kind of the wishy-washy 50-50 crap, wasn't working for them, wasn't working for their opponents, wasn't working for the company. So this finish, this finish made more sense. This finish maybe suggested that they were learning a little bit from some of their mistakes. They're certainly not learning from all of them because you had enough other mistakes throughout the show. But that was an important lesson to learn is these guys need to go over more if you're going to actually pretend that they're big stars. What was really fascinating about this show was two weeks ago, the Dark Order were your closing big angle, and it was a disaster. So you come back this week, and you run one vignette, and you keep it moving. You got the Young Bucks acting like this didn't really happen, the rest of the elite like the attack didn't really happen. And maybe that's a good audible to call. It shows that they're listening and learning from the mistake of a couple of weeks ago. But it also feels kind of like a mistake because you've been building up this group for a little bit. Yeah. Just running one vignette doesn't feel like appropriate follow-up. But nonetheless, I can live with it for now. What I can't live with, though, is the 50-50 booking. you got to stop this crap. You're in a business right now that desperately needs stars. In particular, All Elite Wrestling needs marketable stars, and they don't have them. Sure, within their own hot topic, Meltzer Mark cocoon of cucking for moves and matches and stuff, they do, but you're not in that business anymore. And just because you pop the live crowd doesn't automatically mean that that translates to TV. You have to do better. You have to make your stars actually feel like stars. You have to make it feel like people are missing out if they don't see these guys. Like there has to be a hierarchy or there has to be a pecking order. And right now, it feels like the vast majority of the roster is full of a bunch of the same type of mid-card guys. That's not good. That's not helpful to anybody. And it's going to continue to be to the detriment of all elite wrestling here in 2020 if they don't change the philosophy. You can't have Cody working a 50-50 match with Darby Allen and struggling to win and needing Arnie Anderson's out-of-the-blue help to win. 
You can't have Moxley struggling to beat Trent. If you were having Cody wrestle Moxie, Moxley, then a 50-50 match is called for makes sense and can potentially elevate both guys. Does that make sense? In this case, though, you didn't do that, and it doesn't help anybody involved. Like it or not, that's the reality, the way I see it. And especially when it comes to all elite wrestling and this cocoon of cucking that we're talking about here. You need this angry wrestling man in this show more than ever because this is not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. If you like the review, hit thumbs up. If you haven't already done so, subscribe, click the bell, what the hell, so that way you're notified every time I do a video on this channel.